I really appreciate being invited out here to talk about our work at NBAC. Um, we're interested in anything that's potentially useful for pathogen forensics. And today I'm going to talk about an algorithm called MinHash and how that can be used to analyze nanopore data on computing hardware that's just as portable as the sequencer itself. Uh, I have to show this slide uh, just saying we're funded by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, but I don't work for them and I don't speak for them. Um, so we've heard a lot about this device and its unique properties in the last couple days. Uh, of course, it's real time. You can see the reads coming off it as they're sequenced. So that's really useful. It's also very portable. Um, but of course, there are always drawbacks. In this case, the error rate is still pretty high compared to something like second generation short read sequencing. So one thing we can do with this portable little device is ask, what are we putting into it? Um, in this case, like a microbe, we want to know what it is. But since it's so portable and unique, we can do this in places we can't do it with other things, like, for example, on the space station, uh, which if you saw the talk last night at the dinner, uh, there are already lots of plans to do this kind of thing. Um, initial zero gravity tests have already been done. Um, but if you want to analyze the data, you have to use algorithms that kind of play to the strengths of this device and can accommodate the weaknesses if you really want to take full advantage of it. So for example, it's a real-time sequencer, so your algorithm has to accommodate streaming data. You don't want to wait until everything's collected and then do something like assemble. Also has to be fast. Uh, that helps with streaming, uh, but that also helps with portability because having this tiny little sequencer doesn't do you much good if you need a big room full of compute cluster to analyze the data. And you can always use cloud, something like that. But if you're asking about these really extreme environments, space, desert, Arctic, under the ocean, whatever, really ideally you want small hardware that you can take with it. Another big aspect of portability is memory. Um, so memory, you can get you know, half a terabyte, a terabyte on a big workstation or cluster. But on something like a laptop, you'd have less, maybe 16 or 32. And if you think even smaller, more to the scale of this device, now you're talking about one or two gigabytes. You, of course, want it to be robust. You can't be relying on long exact matches because this platform is relatively high error. And finally, you want a measure of significance because if you're streaming this relatively high error data, you want to know when you have enough data because otherwise you're just going to have to collect a whole bunch anyway. So you need to know kind of what you know and where you stand. So KMR-based methods are a good place to start. Um, they're alignment free, assembly free. Uh, so as a simple example, if you have this alignment which has 50% identity, um, you just look at each overlapping sequence, so CAT, ATG, GCA, et cetera. Um, and then you make a table of the composition of each of these, remove duplicates, and see what they have in common. Then you can do something like a Jacquard index of set similarity. And you can even convert that to something more like a nucleotide distance. Uh, for example, this uh, formula assumes a Poisson distribution of errors in each camera. And in this little simple example, it, you get a good result. So cameras kind of fall over here. Um, you can get significance. Uh, the statistics are well studied. And they're certainly robust to error rates. Uh, you can stream them. You can update those tables in real time if you want. Uh, but they're not quite fast enough. And more importantly, the memory, if you're storing every camera in a sequence, you have huge tables, and it takes up a lot of memory. So we need to reduce the problem. And as is often the case in bioinformatics, biologists weren't the first ones to run into this kind of data problem. So here we have AltaVista, which in 1999 was the most powerful and useful guide to the net, apparently. <laughs> um, and one of the things you have to do for web search is you have to cluster a lot of similar pages so you don't get swamped with the same result over and over again. Uh, and this guy, Andre Broder, uh, published his paper in 1997 called On the Resemblance and Containment of Documents. 
And what he did was treated documents as what he called shingles, which were series of overlapping words or phrases. Shingles because they're overlapping. Uh, but in the, in the context of DNA, I mean, what is a genome but just a long string? So if you think of each base as a word, that's analogous to his shingles because they're just k-mers. Uh, and he introduced this algorithm called min-hash. And the way it works is if you sort, in this case, your k-mers, and you kind of line them up so you can step through in order from each one, which you would call a merge sort in computer science, um, he observed that if you just take some subset like this s, there's really no reason for this to have any more or less similarity than the entire set. So the min is, you're just taking the minimum hash. The hash part is not illustrated here. It's a little more abstract. But uh, in summary, you don't want, for example, AAAC to come right after AAAA because they're also similar. That could bias you. Uh, so you want to sort these based on something other than the actual similarity. And that's what the hash does. You run each one of these kamers through a hash function. You get this series of bits, and you're sorting it based on those. Uh, but just for illustration, they're sorted alphabetically here. So in this case, it's a little contrived example, but we get 0.25, which is pretty close to the 0.22 if we just look at you know, two of these shared cameras over the eight we're looking at. Uh, another important observation of this Broder paper was that the error of these estimates are bounded. So you can get a significance estimate. You know it's going to be a good measure uh, for example, if you flip a coin a million times, you'll get almost exactly 0.5, but you kind of know if you do it a few hundred times, you can estimate. That's going to give you a pretty good idea of what the uh, probability is. Uh, and then this equation, slightly modified from the earlier one, is what we use to translate this from a set metric into more of a nucleotide distance. Uh, it's modified a little to account for differing genome sizes, but I won't go into the derivation of that. Uh, so if you compare this to something more traditional, like average nucleotide identity, uh, in this case we took 500 E. coli, um, and we made them represent various subclades. Uh, and then on the x-axis here, we, oops. We have one minus average nucleotide identity, so more like a distance. And on the y-axis, we have our min-hash distance, or MASH distance, as we call it for short. Going from left to right, we have uh, this S, which is the subset, or we call it a sketch size, because we're sketching these. Uh, that's from the Broder paper also, actually. So if you take 500, 1,000, 5,000, and then going from top to bottom, increasing the camera size and seeing how well it correlates with A and I. And these numbers in the corners are root mean square errors. So you can see there's kind of a sweet spot at K equals 21, which is pretty much expected. Uh, the sketch size, as it gets bitter, bigger, they're kind of diminishing returns. So you can see here 1,000 is pretty much good enough. And taking five times that many doesn't really get you a lot better. So if we look at a larger scale, scale example, uh, so this is all 55,000 genomes in RefSeq. Uh, we took sketches of these, and that let us do a pairwise comparison, so all 3 billion or 1.5 billion unique comparisons of these organisms. And what you can see here is each one of these clusters is if you cut off at 0.05 distance and draw a line for all of those. Uh, and then we color based on the NCBI taxonomy for species. And these look like pretty much what you would expect. Uh, there are some interesting things here, like the E. coli and Shigella kind of mix. You can barely see some purple there mixed in with the dark gray. Uh, or over here, the B. serious group. We know those kind of are intermingled, and you see exactly what you would expect. So the sketching for this, or taking those min hashes for each genome, took a total of about 
26 CPU hours. And then since the problem was reduced so much, uh, doing all those pairwise comparisons only took another 20 CPU hours. Uh, for this RefSeq database, we used a K of 16, which is a little lower than ideal, but it lets us use a 32-bit integer instead of a 64. So for computing reasons, uh, that lets us keep a smaller database. And then sketch size six, uh, 400. Also, the smaller your sketch size, the smaller the database. And we want to prove a point of how small we can go, and 400 works pretty well. So in this case, we took 600 gigabytes of FASTA sequence data from RefSeq and sketched it down to less than 100 megabytes, so over a 6,000 x compression. Of course, lossy, but you can obviously do a lot with this compressed data. Another thing you can do is query it. So for example, you start with a new genome, and this could be this whole genome or contigs. You make the sketch of it. That takes about a second for a microbial genome. And now that it's compressed, it only takes one more second to compare that sketch against all 55,000 of these RefSeq database sketches. And then you can just see what your best hit is. But also remember, since these are KMERS, you don't even need contigs or assemblies or uh, full genomes. You can start with reads. And the only caveat here is we want to get rid of the errors because KMER methods are pretty sensitive to error. Uh, we don't want to build a KMER table, though, to throw away unique KMERs because now we're back to this big memory requirement. But what you can do is approximate this with something called a Bloom filter. And this will get rid of most of your unique KMERs while guaranteeing that everything that's not unique still gets through. And it takes a lot less memory than the whole KMER table. So now we have a set of repeated KMERs that we think are probably real, probably not errors, or close enough. We can sketch those and compare them against the RefSeq database, just like with the genome. And that process of running through the Bloom filter and sketching, we can do about 1,000 reads per second. And then each time we want to update that streaming camera table and see what our best hit is, it just takes one more second. So if you can do 1,000 reads a second, the question is, how many reads do you need? Uh, to test this, we took subsets based on the timestamps of the reads coming off and looked at how good of a result we could get. So in the first column here, we're looking at the first 100 reads, the first 200 reads, et cetera. Uh, then the coverage, we mapped it to what we knew was the correct reference, just to see how much that's being filled in. The third column is, if you look at the best hit, from querying RefSeq, uh, what is it? And if it's a tie, then we just take the lowest common ancestor. And finally, I didn't go over the derivation of the p-value, but this is basically telling us uh, how likely is it that if you just had random sequences, would you see this many cameras shared in the min hash just by chance? So our first 100 reads doesn't cover a lot, as you would expect, not a great result, but it at least um, gets rid of eukaryotes. We know it's a microbe. P-value is pretty bad, about 30%. At 200 reads, we cover about a quarter of the genome. And now we've already narrowed it down to the family. P-value is getting a little better. And once we have 300 reads covering about a third of the genome, that's enough that our top hit is actually the correct strain. And the P-value is looking better. And from there, it just stabilizes, and the P-value continues to improve. So if you only need that much coverage, how long do you have to run your min-ion? So this is a different organism, um, Bacillus anthracis, uh, but we made this little movie of if you map the reads in the order they came off, how much of the genome are they covering? This is sped up 300 times, or 30 times. And what we're looking for here is 2x, remember, because we're throwing out unique KMERS, because they could be errors. But we only need about 30% coverage. So at this point, it's plenty. Uh, this sped up 30 times, so that translates to about a few minutes of running this. And this is also just an interesting video to watch. You can kind of see the bias away from the center of the genome. So minhash 
is a camera-based method, but since it reduces the problem, it gets us right there in the middle because it's much faster and has a much lower memory footprint. We can store that whole RefSeq in less than 100 megabytes, which will fit on pretty much any device. And what, let, what that lets us do, if we go back to our original question, is answer that with something like this. This is called a parallel board. Uh, if you're familiar with Raspberry Pi, it's a very similar concept. It's a hobbyist's mini computer. We just happened to try it on this one. Uh, the hardware is very similar to like an old iPhone. I think it has a gig of RAM. We were able to load that RefSeq database on here with room to spare and use the Bloom filter and run the reads and get the right result. So there are other applications for this too. Uh, this minhash algorithm is very useful. Uh, if you remember the original title of that paper, it's resemblance and containment. So containment in this case could mean metagenomics. So this is a little backwards from traditional metagenomics where you would take each read and try to ask what it is. This is more like your whole read set is um, the large document and then you're asking if each one of your reference genomes is contained in that read set. Of course, the caveat is you need somewhat sufficient coverage, but we've done some initial tests of this and it looks promising. Another application, something like pre-alignment or pseudo-alignment, where you localize your min hashes to windows in a genome, and then you can take something smaller like a read and figure out instead of which genome is it, where in the genome does it go? And we've done some tests with that, and it looks like there's also a lot of potential there. So the software implementing this MinHash algorithm, as I was talking about it, is called, we're calling MASH. Uh, it's available now on GitHub. There's a preprint of this work on BioArchive, documentation at Read the Docs. Uh, these are all people that contributed to it. Um, we're collaborating with people at NHGRI, uh, and we have this consortium for our collaboration uh, called Marble Maryland Bioinformatics Lab uh, on GitHub. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'll take any questions. There's one just down here. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned you loaded the reads onto the Perello board implementation. So you still need like a laptop hooked up with Minnow to collect the, to actually sequence, right? Or... Right. I mean, there's also the issue of base calling, which I kind of glossed over, but this is kind of in theory, how small of a device can you really analyze the data. You could possibly be running this sort of in parallel, sort of grabbing yes. the data in real time, I guess, and then you can... Uh, yes, and I should say that the, the software as released now, we're still developing the actual streaming, but right now what you can do with it is take a read set, sketch it, and query. Um, uh, looks very compelling. A right, quick question on some species identification, like in the Bacillus genus, some uh, species that could be separated only by even a single SNP, uh, like PLCR and, and, and Bacillus and Thracis. Do you can you tease out very very uh, subtle differences like that as well? Uh, if you have sufficient coverage, uh, yeah, in a lot of cases you can. Um, and of course, you need to look at your p values. So that's an important aspect of it um, to make sure that. These are significant hits. Why did you have the bias towards the ends of the genome as the graph was expanding? Um, I'm not a biologist, but I think that's uh, replication. Thank you very much. Thank you.